Okay. Fabian, you and me are not muted. There's a real rush of people entering the meeting right now. Okay. We get started. This yeah. meeting is being recorded. Um all right, so hello everyone. Welcome to the second day of um, this first electronic symposium on protistology. So it looks like we have again a very large attendance today, which is really great to see. Yesterday at, it, at its peak, we had over 500 people following or at least unique entries, um, including a very large audience on, on YouTube. So hi to people on YouTube as well. Thanks for uh, tuning in. It might well be the, the largest uh, attendance for a produce meeting, so we're pretty excited about this. Um, and also, thanks a lot to everyone for uh, overly positive and encouraging comments. It was really great to see, um, and we hope this is the start of many of those meetings. So I'm, I'm Fabian Berkey from Uppsala University, and I will be chairing this first session before the coffee break. We will follow exactly the same setup as yesterday. Um, so we have, again, three 20-minute talks um, plus 10-minute questions and two talks of 10 minutes plus five-minute questions. Um, uh, so um, that's, that's that. And then at the end of the, so, so during the questions, please raise your electronic hands um, if you have a question. And you can find this option in the, in the participants tab under the more button. Uh, button at the bottom. So if you click the, the more button, then you have a little hand, you can raise that, and then we'll take the question um, uh, in order. Um, yes, um, again, we really appreciate that the, the speakers uh, stay on time. It helps us uh, to, to, to move smoothly. Um, I don't think I have anything else to say here. So without further ado, Let's get started with uh, Purification Lopez Garcia from the CNRS and University Paris Sud. Um, and Puri is going to talk uh, about the Protestant way to uh, fungi. So I think I've, I've stopped sharing my screen here. So Puri, you can share yours and uh, you're good to go. Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Can you see my screen? Well, so, it yeah, it's all good. Um, okay, so I yes, go. Hi, uh, hello, again, everyone. We really uh, so, and first of the, all, the, thanks the to Patrick, Fabian, and Javi for um, organizing this uh, symposium. I think it's a really great idea. So I'm going to talk about the origin and um, early evolution of um, uh, sorry, I had my screen blocked for a while. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the origin and early evolution of uh, fungi from a Protestant perspective. And most of what I'm going to talk about is actually work by uh, Luis Calindo, who is uh, the, the artist making these little drawings and uh, um, um, uh, Torreya in our team, but also in collaboration with David Moreira and especially Sergei Karpov, who spent uh, uh, almost two years with us in Orsay in France. Um, so fungi are an extremely ecologically successful group of uh, eukaryotes uh, that belong to the opistocons, one of the major eukaryotic supergroups. And actually opistocons are divided into two major branches uh, that encompass organisms that have developed uh, complex multicellularity. Uh, uh, animals in the case of holozoa that also encompass their unicellular relatives 
and uh, uh, fungi in the case of holomycota. Fungi are uh, actually quite diverse and they encompass a wide variety of lineages. Uh, uh, the ones that are uh, branching deeply, uh, chytrids and blastocladiomycota include uh, unicellular and flagellated states. But then we have other lineages showing different degrees of multicellularity until we reach the dicaria, where we have a complex multicellularity based on early femoral cellularity uh, as compared to that of animals. So as we uh, learned yesterday from um, Iñaki Restrillo's talk, um, yeah, the identifying and uh, describing, uh, studying the unicellular relatives of animals was very important to understand how uh, multicellularity evolved in this particular group, and many of the genes involved in that are already present in these other lines. In the case of Holomycota, uh, for a long time, the, uh, the closest unicellular relatives to fungi were nuclearids, but they are actually quite different. Uh, they are non-flagellated phagotrophic amoeba that predate on bacteria. However, in, in these in recent years, we have uh, been populating the holomycotan branch with other lineages, including rosellids and microsporidia. So rosellids are uh, an or uh, uh, microsporidia or, uh, or cryptomycota or rosellomycota, these are all synonyms, are uh, a large group of organisms encompassing many uh, organisms that are not described uh, coming from uh, the environment uh, that has uh, uh, parasitic phagotrophs of um, uh, fungi and also uh, all mycids. Uh, microsporidia are very well known uh, parasites known for a long time. They are very uh, simple organisms that have this type of uh, polar tube for infection that they can coil in the cell like this. And actually core microsporidia were known for a long time. Uh, they are really fast evolving, as you can say, from the branch length that you can see here. And this was actually one of the reasons why in early phylogenetic trees of eukaryotes, they appear as the earliest, the most uh, early branching group until uh, multi-gene phylogenies place this group as uh, or, uh, a close relative to fungi. But we now know other groups that have shorter branches and that uh, belong to microsporidia, such as mechnicovelids, and also some organisms that kind of mm, uh, fill the gap between rosellids and, 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 and microsporidia, such as paramicrosporidium or mitosporidium. Um, and some authors include also microsporidia and rosellids within fungi, that would be fungi sensulato, and actually defining uh, what uh, the, the boundary of fungi is uh, not that easy. Uh, traditionally, fungi are described as uh, organisms that are osmotrophs, and this is uh, in relation with the fact that they possess a chitin, a chitin wall also in the vegetative stage, in the, in the uh, feeding uh, stage, so that this prevents them from uh, uh, performing phagocytosis, um, and which is uh, the major feeding mode of uh, uh, the mass majority of opistocons. Uh, microsporidia and rosellids have uh, also chitin, but only in the resting cysts. Because microsporidia and rosellids are um, parasites, uh, some uh, authors have also proposed uh, a parasitic origin for fungi. Uh, but is that so? And here is where I uh, talk about aphelids, which are um, um, a diverse uh, group of phagotrophic parasites of algae. This is what uh, remains of uh, uh, an algal culture after a failure infection. Uh, so these filamentous algae are uh, almost all dead with these residual bodies that you can see here. And their lifestyle, uh, their, their life cycle is actually quite similar to that of rosellids or cryptomycota. So they, start, they have a, an infecting, infective cyst uh, that injects an organic, uh, an amoeboid organism within uh, the, the space defined by the uh, algal cell wall. 
And this amoeba hits actually the cytoplasm by uh, phagocytosis before becoming uh, forming a syncytium and then liberating uh, soil spores that are ameboflagellated. So you can see here in this uh, SEM picture. Um, of course, these organisms have been known for actually uh, about a century, but we lacked molecular information for them until uh, some years ago, uh, Sergei Karpov and co workers uh, published the first or determined the first uh, RNA, uh, ribosomal RNA sequence. Uh, for Ameba Felidium protococcarum, a member of the group. And this cluster with a group of environmental sequences suggesting that uh, environmental sequences suggesting that this is a very diverse group. And then phylogenetic trees using this marker together with uh, 28S parosomal RNA genes and also uh, RNA polymerase genes place Ameba Felidium as uh, the, the sister group to Microsporidia and forming a monophyletic group with Rosella. So this was the basis for Sergei uh, Karpov to propose uh, that this um, apparently monophyletic group uh, uh, was uh, the Opistosporidia, so he defined a new group for them, uh, the, the major characteristic of which was the primary uh, phagotrophic ability as compared to fungi, uh, that are osmotrophs. However, uh, the support for the uh, sisterhood of amelophilidium with microsporidia and actually for the monophily of the group was actually not very good. And also amelophilidium has a relatively long branch within a felid, but fortunately we have now other uh, aphelids described um, and we were lucky enough uh, as to generate uh, uh, on an almost complete uh, transcriptome for Paraphelidium fibonemae, 91% uh, completeness according to Busco and representing uh, uh, all the life stages. And now with this transcriptome, we carried out phylogenomic analysis using uh, three different uh, data sets uh, uh, of different sizes from 24,000 uh, conserved amino acid positions to more than 90,000. And uh, uh, both uh, Bayesian and um, maximum likelihood trees place paraphelidium as the sister group to fungi, um, uh, excluding microsporidia and crocellids. And the support was particularly good for, for the largest data sets, and especially when you remove the fastest evolving uh, microsporidia. And actually, the support was even maximal for the smallest uh, data set when you remove progressively the fastest evolving site. So uh, this appeared to be a rather um, support, well-supported relationship. So having this transcriptome, then we try to look for particular functional traits. We look for genes involved in chitin biosynthesis and degradation, and we found them. And then we look for chitin in the different life stages, but we only found chitin as shown here in red by this with uh, uh, germaglutinin staining in uh, the infective cyst, but not in the trophon or the soil spores. We also found a diversity of cellulases that we think are involved in the penetration of uh, uh, the parasite uh, uh, through the algal uh, cell wall, uh, as you can see here in this uh, SEM picture that is, has false colors. So the, in pink, you have the infective cysts, and some of them are broken. So you see that uh, infective tube here. And sometimes this, was, this uh, cysts is called, uh, exploit also or used uh, mechanically uh, weak points. Um, because uh, these aphelids are parasites, we were perhaps thinking that they had some type of uh, reduced metabolism. So we look for uh, more than 1,000 orthologs uh, involved in different categories of primary metabolism. And actually, we were surprised to see that paraphelidium uh, clusters uh, with fungi and far away from uh, parasitic rosellids or microsporidia. And this is also uh, seen in this cluster analysis where you have paraphelidium in the middle of fungi and uh, 
far away from microsporidia or rosellids, which are actually quite reduced. So it actually has um, a, a, a gene complement involved in primary metabolism that is not distinguishable for, from that of free living or organisms. So this is actually a thoughts with the idea that um, uh, fungi have or had a parasitic origin and rather support the idea that the ancestor of this whole group uh, was a free living predator possibly specialized in endobiotic um, uh, predation. Um, and it had already an amoebo flagellate stage and a resting assist with chitin. And the ancestor of fungi was a freely, most likely a free living osmotroph uh, with chitin also in the dispersive test. So uh, I, uh, I think that this is actually the defining uh, boundary that uh, closed the, tra the transition from a phagotrophic to an osmotrophic uh, lifestyle and that gave uh, our fungi uh, the possibility to have that ecological success that they, uh, uh, they display but with the possibility also to colonize a wide variety of land ecosystems. We now move into uh, early fungal evolution, and I already show uh, this scheme showing uh, that the earliest branching um, fungi are actually half flagellated states, but we actually, um, the, the, this part of the tree is not well resolved, and it is unclear whether blastoflaviomycota or chytris, chytridiomycota, are the, the, the most uh, uh, or the earliest uh, branching in the fungal tree. And uh, here is where I introduce another, a new, another new group of, of uh, organisms, holomycotans, fungi, that is represented by Ameborradix bromovi, uh, which is an unusual sporic fungus. And actually, uh, uh, there are uh, representations of organisms very similar from the late 19th century, with this sporangia showing this kind of uh, atypical uh, capillae. This organism also has uh, amoeboflagellated uh, uh, spores, so spores, but they, uh, this is actually a pseudocilium more than a flagellum. It doesn't beat, and the uh, so spore actually moves by gliding uh, on the substrate. Uh, it also has an atypical feature, a very long kinetosome of around uh, uh, two uh, microns in length that you can see here close to this uh, lipid droplet. Uh, of course, we knew, these, uh, we knew these organisms uh, for a long time, but no molecular sequences. So uh, we actually generated the uh, uh, 16, uh, 18S and 28S, uh, 28S chromosomal RNA genes from uh, enrichment culture, single sporangia, and a single amoeboid source spores. And this actually helped us to validate the life cycle. And uh, it turned out that Ameborradix uh, was a sister uh, to another uh, uh, Incertaicetes fungus, Sanchitrium chirbonimatis, also a parasite of uh, algae, and formed a highly divergent group with a very long branch that was very unstable. So it branched with low support, either as a sister to uh, Lomeromycota or uh, to the Dicaria. So then we try to obtain uh, using a single cell approaches genomes for these organisms and actually do both them. We produce a, a trans, uh, we sequence the genome of Ameborradix and a genome for, for Sanchitrium trebonimatis and also a trans from this organism as well. Uh, the genomes were uh, quite complete, actually 92% according to Dusko using a, a fungal database. And uh, they were um, compared to the genomes of other uh, zoosporic fungi, as you can see here in these uh, tables of summary statistics. Um, they were actually quite reduced, quite small. And they also have a relatively low GC content, which is indicative of a parasitic um, adaptation or uh, lifestyle. Um, so, uh, we, of course, carried out phylogenomic analysis, this time using 264 proteins. And here, what we see is uh, with full support, 
uh, the fact that Sankitram appears at, at, as their sister group or, or the most basal group of Blastocladiomycota. And, and the other of interesting observation is that chytrids Cladiomycota appear also with full support uh, at uh, the base or, or, or branch uh, early, uh, the earliest group uh, uh, in the fungal tree. So now we have a fully resolved fungal tree where we can map uh, different features and the first lineage to uh, diverge where the chytrids. Um, of course, because some chytrids are parasites, we uh, thought that uh, we might see signs of reduction and we looked first for metabolic genes. And uh, again, uh, more than 1,000 orthologs uh, covering different metabolic categories. And actually, ameboradix and synchytrum in this type of principal component analysis detach from classical fungi and tend to get closer to uh, gross elite script, uh, cryptomycota and also these two um, nuclearids. And you can see also that here in this uh, cluster analysis. Um, and so the most affected categories uh, in terms of reduction are, are carbohydrate and especially lipid metabolism. But reduction can, can also be seen in other features. And in particular in this uh, atypical flagellum that they have. Uh, so here you have uh, uh, um, uh, uh, TEM images of the axonem and the kinetosome, the ultrastructure of this uh, uh, structure in normal um, uh, eukaryotes, let's say normal flagella, and those for Sankitrum and Ameboradix. And uh, as you can see, you have uh, singlets instead of doublets, or sometimes doublets instead of triplets, uh, so that the whole structure of this flagellum or, or flagellum or pseudocilium is actually reduced. But still, uh, okay, and then we look for the genes involved uh, usually in the development of flagella and actually uh, sankitrids form uh, a kind of intermediate uh, between flagellated lineages and non-flagellated lineages. So they still keep or uh, retain uh, some uh, genes involved in flagella development, but they have lost uh, the intraflagellar transport protein, uh, or most of that, and uh, the dynamics. And so, uh, sankitrids represent an independent uh, re reduction, potentially loss, but reduction of the flagellum. And the, actually, the loss of the flagellum has occurred several times within the fungi and within the holomycota in general. Uh, but still the flagellum is there and you have some uh, these long kineto, uh, uh, kinetosomes, so um, uh, you can uh, wonder why uh, this flagellum is retained. And we think that it might have to do with uh, phototaxis, with phototactic responses. And actually it has been recently shown that some uh, um, blastocladiomycota have licensing organs uh, represented by this lipid vesicles that are surrounded by a membrane. And uh, uh, this membrane contains a typical protein that is, results from the fusion of one type rhodopsin and one one in cyclist uh, domain. Um, and so uh, with light, uh, green light immunization, uh, there is a response and, 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 and the membrane gets energized. And so there is a phototactic response. And we actually see similar structures in the case of sankitrids, as you can see in these TEM images with this chain of lipid globules that are very closely associated to the kinetosome here. And so, and, and, and actually we do find the, the, this, uh, the homolog to this protein uh, in sankitrids. So we hypothesize that actually uh, the, uh, Flagellum, the reduced flagellum has to do with uh, the response to light. And it's not, it does not produce mov movement, but it serves like a ruler, like some kind of guiding tool to respond to light. And I think I've been a bit too long, maybe, so I'm not going to uh, go through the conclusions, but just go to the acknowledgement and thank again uh, the people who actually did the work or most of the work, and uh, also the members of my team and uh, the different funders. Thank you for your attention.
thank you very, very much, Puri. Um, so we have uh, time to take questions from the audience. So please raise your hand. Um, if you have a question, we can give a few seconds to people uh, to raise their hand there. I am not seeing, uh, I see a hand, Alistair Simpson. Um, so I'm going to uh, ask people who ask question if they can say their name fully so that people on YouTube um, know who's asking a question. Um, so Alistair, uh, you can go. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Puri. Uh, the sand chytrids you said move by gliding. Um, the soil spores, uh, well, do some kind of amoeboid movement. Uh, yeah. Oh, I so see. They, it's amoeboid movement, maybe, and they, they kind of glide on the substrates, but it's really amoeboid movement. Okay, um, the, the pseudocilium isn't in contact with the surface. Uh, it is, it looks like a gliding uh, or, or tool or something like that, but it, it does not actually beat or, or, and it can be completely retracted. So you can get uh, purely amoeboid uh, uh, shapes. And they still move? No. Okay, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, next question from Thibaut Brunet. Uh, Thibaut, you can ask your question now. Good question. Um, so the flagellum doesn't beat, but you think it might be involved in gliding in some chytrids, is that right? Not the flagellum, uh, but they, there are uh, uh, this kind of pseudo, uh, philopodia pseudopods that uh, do the movement. Flagellum just is, is lying behind, so it's not actually beating or uh, participating in the movement. So you think it might be purely sensory, for example? Yes, that's what we think. Okay. Um, okay, thank you, Thibault. Um, uh, we have another question from Toman, Thomas, Thomas Whelan. Come on, you can ask your question. Hi, Piri. Uh, great talk. Um, I was wondering, Rosella kind of does something very similar where it in, um, invades the host and phagocyte hoses the cytoplasm of the host. So what do you think that the uh, phallid that you have here is so much less reduced than Rosella, where Rosella seems like it's already reducing towards paradism seen in microsporidia? I think that from uh, that actually fungible from some kind of a felid like uh, organism that was almost a free living predator. It's not free living because it goes into a, an intra cell wall space. But then there were two possible ways to go. One was the one that took the fungi and then they became osmotrophs. And then the other one was going further on the, the reduction and the obligate parasitic way. And that's where we find uh, rosellids, actually. So I think, and, and then uh, microsporidia. So I think that they took this um, reductive pathway that aphelids doesn't seem, don't seem to show. Um, all right. Thanks. Um, we have a, a couple of more minutes. I, I have a, a question, actually. I, I think you, you showed a, a slide about this, but I was not paying attention at this time. But is there a, a possibility that aphelids are paraphyletics? Uh, paraphyletic? Uh, is, there, is there a possibility that aphelids are paraphyletic? Uh, there is a possibility, and for that we need a second aphelid genome or transcriptome, and actually we are working on that. We have uh, RNA from a second aphelid, and I, I think that we will try to find that, but yes, of course, things might change, and there, that possibility would be very interesting, by the way. Because you could also say uh, or think that maybe fungi are within a felid. So that's another question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's where I was going. But okay, it, thanks. It I guess first, and then uh, yeah. But you you are absolutely right. That's possibly true, which would be okay. great. Future will tell. 
Okay, cool. Well, uh, if there's no more question for Piri, uh, I think uh, we can thank her again. Uh, it was really, really interesting. Thank you so much. Thank so um, we will now, uh, so if you can stop, yes. So uh, then um, we'll move on to the next speaker, which is Julius Lucas from the Institute of Par Parasitology at the University of South Bo Bohemia in Czech Republic. Um, yes, um, I am not seeing Julius. Uh, do you have your, your video turn on, Julius? Can, ah, there we go, okay. Can you see it now? Yes, we can see it now. Okay, I will scroll up. Yeah, so we are fine, yeah? I Yeah, we are fine. Enlarge it, yeah. Okay, Perfect. Uh, uh, so thanks again for inviting me. This is uh, <laughs> very new uh, to me and I hope I will handle it somehow. So I would like to draw your attention to the mitochondria of two uh, protists, uh, Euglena and Trypanosoma. This is done in collaboration uh, with um, the Euglena part with uh, Mark Field and uh, the Trypanosoma part primarily with the Keith Gall lab in Oxford. Uh, Euglenozoan protists, as you know, are composed of three major groups, Euglenids, that are mostly photosynthetic, uh, important in ecosystems, uh, kinetoplastids, which include uh, famous pathogens of humans and other vertebrates, trypanosomes, leishmania, and then diplonemids, which is uh, a group that was kind of rediscovered, is extremely diverse and highly abundant in the oceans. And they are shown here with their features. Uh, uh, they are quite peculiar, each of these groups. Here is another rendition. So here you see the kinetoplastids uh, are well studied for many, many years, for decades. Uh, many genomes are available, functional genomics uh, working and so on. Diplonemids, uh, there is no complete genome yet available, but hopefully will be published this year. Functional genomics works, so that's, uh, that makes them amenable to um, functional studies. And euglenids, uh, there is pretty much only one genome available, but several transcriptomes and uh, getting DNA there and doing what uh, you want is, is pretty challenging still. Uh, mostly mitochondria have been studied in protists in the parasitic ones, like kinetoplastids, neglaria, as you can see here, AP complexan, uh, except chromera, uh, if you feel you. So we know very little about the free living ones. Uh, a typical mitochondrion, and as, as we all know, every eukaryotes have a mitochondria so far, except a single uh, very cool exception, or maybe a, a one small group that uh, seems to uh, lost it completely. And the paradigm is that the aerobic mitochondrion is probably most complex. Then uh, there is a reduction uh, to hydrogenosomes, mitosomes, uh, so from a fully fledged uh, mitochondrion, uh, it can shrink to a small vesicle which hosts a few proteins uh, that are involved in iron sort of cluster assembly. And uh, so it may be a more complicated story. So what we did was we, uh, we embarked on uh, studying the mitochondrion and plast it in euglena uh, because it's, it's, uh, uh, it can live anaerobically, aerobically, uh, has uh, quite a few interesting uh, pathways in this mito its mitochondrion predicted and is of biotechnological interest. So what we did was we, we lysed the cell, put them on sucrose gradient, ultracentrifuge them, uh, and got peroxisomes, chloroplast, and mitochondrion uh, in a very pure form, fortunately. Uh, and this is actually now published in MVP, I think, um, almost came out. What was interesting was that the number of proteins uh, that were um, kind of confidently uh, localized to be in the mitochondria is way higher than 
anything else. As you can see, the comparison with uh, Saccharomyces is, and with humans uh, and with T. brucei, um, uh, there is a pretty uh, big distance uh, towards uh, uh, the mitochondria of Euglena. So it seems to be highly complex. And an example of a, a one pathway that is well studied uh, across mitochondria is the iron sulfur cluster uh, in thesis, where you can see uh, that um, it, it, there is nothing new on the pathway. It's just complexified. There is more proteins uh, than you would expect, uh, more chaperones and more proteins that are involved, uh, duplicates and so on, than uh, you find in, in other eukaryotic mitochondria. Uh, here is just a, a rendition of the protein import machinery, dark blue is mass spec evidence, light blue is uh, presence in transcriptomes and gray is, is absent. Uh, what was uh, stunning is that even with this enormous complexity of the mitoproteome, uh, Euglena has no sign of RNA editing machinery. So this 100 proteins that are present in tripanosomes and pretty much uh, extremely well studied actually, they are absent. Uh, while there is 200, a family of 200 mitochondrial transcription termination factors and ribosome assembly factors. So uh, we have no clue what these are doing, but uh, the sheer number is, is stunning. And so uh, actually the total mitoproteome is estimated to be close to 2,500 proteins, which is for a single cellular organism uh, huge. And I would argue that uh, our favorite protists will have more complex mitochondria than uh, humans and, uh, and then other multicellular organisms. So that was the story of the mitochondrion of, of uh, Euglena. And uh, let's go to trypanosomes, as uh, shown here, with red blood cells, uh, causative agents of African sleeping sickness, <coughs> the, the incidence of which is going down. Uh, the particularly interesting feature of the mitochondrion of trypanosomes is that it comes in two strikingly different forms. One is in the mammals, uh, where uh, the mitochondrion is produced, uh, morphologically reduced, has almost or no, no Christie at all, kind of a sausage uh, shape in the cell. Uh, and the bloodstream stage does not rely on it. Uh, it relies on glycolysis uh, because it lives in blood and has uh, access to unlimited amount of glucose. Uh, the situation is uh, much different in the Tsetse fly vector where the mitochondrion gets reticulated, grows Christi, uh, and is active and produces ATP uh, because they go into an environment that is poor, uh, where probably purine and some other uh, amino acids are the main energy source. Uh, so here is uh, the, uh, let's say, schematic of uh, the mitochondrion in the procyclic or the tsetse fly stage where it is active, where the respiratory chain is uh, functional. Um, everything is uh, like it should be pretty much in an aerobic mitochondrion. Uh, the ATP uh, synthase generates ATP as it should. The picture is quite different and this is known for uh, again, at least 30 years uh, in the bloodstream stage where uh, some of the respiratory complexes are missing and the ATP uh, ACE works uh, as ATP ACE and it consumes ATP to keep up the membrane potential. So it turns in a different direction uh, than in the, um, in the procyclic or tsetse stage. So the mitochondria are different and I also would like to say that there is always a single mitochondrion per trypanosome cell. So, <clears throat> sorry, what we did was we compared the mitoproteomes of the procyclic stage and the bloodstream stage. And the paradigm in the literature was that the procyclic stage will have much more complex mitochondria 
which was supported by a number of uh, range of studies uh, which uh, used uh, antibodies to detect proteins and they showed that in procyclic mitochondrion the proteins are present in the bloodstream mitochondrion they are absent but when you look with mass spectrometry <clears throat> the picture is different and uh, you as you can see here the number of proteins that were detected there is 1200 which is pretty much uh, correct but when we look in the bloodstream mitochondria, it's 960, uh, which is close, which is 80% of the proteins in the procyclic mitochondria. But morphologically, this mitochondrion is really different. Uh, so the, the proteomes uh, look similar, uh, despite the Westerns, uh, which showed that uh, several protein complexes and measurements of mitochondrial activities uh, that show that several um, respiratory complexes are absent in the bloodstream form, but we still found the proteins. Uh, so here is the comparison, uh, a busy slide, just to show that the, 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 the categories of the proteins in both stages that were detected by mass spectrometry by a number of studies are very similar. <clears throat> so the conclusions are, that the mitochondrion, the bloodstream stage, is indeed highly reduced in morphology and activity. Uh, there is no dispute about that, but it is surprisingly not reduced in protein complexity. And there is seemingly a very small amount of proteins that do no function there. But you have to imagine that the trypanosomes go through, through a very dramatic moment when uh, the happy uh, bloodstream stage that lives in a high amount of uh, glucose at 37 degrees, uh, almost a paradise for a parasite, is taken up by the tsetse fly. In a second, it goes from 37 degrees to 27 degrees to very poor environment in terms of nutrients. And it has to fight. It has to struggle for survival in that moment. So it seems beneficial apparently that there is a little tiny amount undetectable by Western, by antibodies uh, in the mitochondria, some kind of seed uh, amount to build as quickly as possible the respiratory complexes before the whole machinery, the transcription, uh, translation does it uh, fully uh, to, to, to restart the mitochondria with those tiny amounts of proteins that have to become functional only when the temperature goes from the 37 to 27 degrees. So that's our kind of hypothesis and uh, further studies will show whether it's true or not. And the third story, <clears throat> maybe the nicest, I dare to say, and still not published, is uh, that um, we, uh, we wanted to know all the proteins uh, uh, in the trypanosome genome, which, uh, uh, whichever build the mitoproteome. And the approach that we took was uh, a little bit different, and uh, I will get to it in a few seconds. So the mitochondrion of kinetoplastids and here of trypanosomes are packed with uh, unique features. One of them is that they have this uh, kinetoplast DNA disk. Their mitochondrial DNA is um, composed of a single network of about 5,000 uh, circular molecules that are come in two categories, so-called maxi circles, which is the typical kind of mitochondrial genome that encodes uh, protein coding genes, and then the mini circles that encode hundreds of different guide RNAs, and those guide RNAs provide information to edit uh, the messenger RNAs from the maxi circles because there is massive RNA editing in this. So that's one feature. And the, the beauty of this is that the kinetoplast, which is located close to the basal body of the flagellum, has been highly studied. And um, a lot is known. And here is just one slide to show how funny and beautiful it is. Uh, as you can see, those two ant green antipodal sites. So imagine that the disk slowly rotates between those two fixed antipodal sites. And the mini circles are decatenated from the periphery, they go to this uh, kinetoflagellar zone where they replicate, 
and then they are recatenated back into the antipodal sites. And the system have to make sure that each and every mini circus replicates only once, because almost every mini circle has a different guide RNAs and all are essential. And this is done by uh, the beautiful trick that the newly replicated mini circles upon their uh, uh, recatenation in the network, they keep a small gap or nick. And only when all mini circles have been replicated once and only once, all the nicks across this 10,000 molecules network are, are mandled, are fixed and filled in, and then it all splits. So uh, a machine, uh, a true machine. And the, mini, uh, the, the uh, transcripts that are produced from this uh, massive, crazy uh, mix of uh, circular DNAs have to go from one protein complex to another to be edited. Uh, some are uh, massively edited, some are moderately edited, some are not edited at all, and about 300 proteins participate in this in the procyclic stage. In the bloodstream stage, this is almost all shut down, and there is nice evidence for that. The mitochondrion of Trypanosoma brucei has giant ribosomes, mitoribosomes. They are very protein rich. Uh, their structure has been um, nicely solved by uh, uh, Andre Schneider and uh, collaborating labs in Switzerland. Uh, in, the science and nature paper uh, in last uh, year. So, uh, and that showed very peculiar features of those uh, mitochondrial ribosomes. And finally, may maybe uh, one more feature, some of the kinetoplastids have giant amount of, my of mitochondrial DNA in, in their mitochondria. In, in the extreme case of Perkinsella, 90% of all cellular DNA are present in the mitochondria. Only 7% are in the nucleus where they encode 7,000 genes. So the genomes tend to inflate enormously. And in diplonema, you can see there is 250 mega of, of mitochondrial DNA there, uh, coding very little, but so it is. And finally, even for such highly conserved uh, mitochondrial protein complexes, such as mycos, which builds the Christi, which are on the base of the Christi and um, ensures the bending uh, of the, of the Christi and interactions with the outer membrane. Uh, there is a big difference between the yeast and trypanosome system as our lab and Andre Schneider lab showed, showed recently. So um, it's, uh, it's an, a really exciting organelle to, to, to study. So we, uh, in order to do that, we took part in a, a major effort by the Gull Lab in Oxford, the aim of which was to tag on the N and C terminals all 9,300 uh, proteins in the T. brucei procyclic stage, which means they generated about 20,000 uh, cell lines. And for each cell line, and this, uh, the, the uh, tagging allowed visualization of the cell by uh, M neon green tag or other tags, but primarily M neon green. And about 100 cells were taken for each cell line. So these are 2 million photos that were taken and analyzed. And uh, at least, uh, I was told, about 5 to 10 visually for each cell line. So uh, this effort lasted for a couple of years. Uh, how the guys did it is beyond me, although I, I saw it happening, but how they organized it, uh, nobody stores these cells, okay? The times are over. It's, it's cheaper. It, it would be more expensive to store 20,000 20, cell lines and then pull them out from the fridge. Uh, they will just send you the sequences of the primer so that you generate the cell line yourself. Uh, and so... Um, this all led to, and, and they will publish a nice paper soon on the localization of all pretty much about somewhere about 95% of proteins within the trypanosome cell. The tagging for some reason 
Of course, it did not work for about 5% of, of those 9,300 uh, protein coding genes. And so what we did, uh, so we got into our domain, all the proteins that were localized to the mitochondria and, and tr were trying to, uh, to extract as much information and we are still uh, doing that. Here is a, a, a comparison with the probably best uh, mitoproteome so far, and it's called importome. And it's based on a nice idea that the Schneider lab had. They knocked down the import of mitochondrial proteins and then compared with their mass spec in a very sensitive way, which proteins went down. And so that way they generated all the proteins uh, a list of proteins that actually uh, uh, get imported from the cytoplasm into the mitochondria, and it's their uh, importer. And it was, it's about 1,200 proteins, and the error rate there is, is uh, pretty small, I'm sure. Um, but there is still some. Uh, our trip tag, uh, mitoproteome, arrived to almost the same number, but as you will see, the, the overlap is. There is a nice overlap, but could have been better. So uh, with, with all the beauty of these uh, sophisticated techniques, uh, there are still some differences there. What we did was that uh, we, uh, and I will not go into details uh, because there is no time for that, but we are able to pretty much assign every uh, out of those 1,190 mitochondria mitochondrial localizing proteins into four uh, compartments into the matrix and in a membrane um, into the integral inner membrane into the intermembrane space or the outer membrane and in the integral outer membrane so we can do that uh, with uh, uh, pretty high confidence we believe here is the situation so far it, this is still uh, ongoing but maybe 95% of this has been done. Uh, so as you can see, most uh, proteins are of course in the matrix and in the inner membrane. Uh, uh, well, the not predicted yet. So this is an early slide, we are further. Uh, but, uh, and uh, below is a table that compares our localization with the data that is available across all the mitochondria pretty much. And as you can see, possibly incorrect tagging and local mislocalization uh, is the rate is uh, pretty low or very low, we, we dare to say. And wrong localization is uh, extremely wrong, extremely rare. Here is just in a few last slides, uh, the famous protein import complexity of a typical eukaryotic, uh, well, there are no other mitochondria, but a typical mitochondrion, uh, aerobic, busy, is the TOM and TIM complexes, TIM 22, TIM 23, TOM 40, SEM 50. Uh, so uh, have a look how that looks like. And here is the import into the mitochondrion of triponosomes. So the uh, TOM or ATOM is there, SEM is there in the outer membrane. In the inner membrane, there is a big change. There is only TIM 22, and this was known by, uh, from the studies before, and TIM 23 is gone. But there are oxaproteins, and there are some other interesting proteins there. So that's quite exciting and, and we are looking into that. And to the right here, as you can see, and this is uh, one last slide that shows when you put the, the tag on the C terminus and it's a mitochondrial protein. So it usually goes where it should because the import signal is there that's shown or pre-sequence on this slide and it goes through uh, the import machinery uh, into its target size. If you uh, tag the protein on the end terminus, you mess up with it and it stays in the cytoplasm. That's very well known. But uh, the, the beauty of the system uh, uh, of this big tagging initiative is that we have uh, a feeling that there is a dedicated protein mach import machinery close to the basal body of the flagellum and close to the keratoplast here. Uh, where there, there, are, uh, there is a structure called tripartite attachment complex, and about a dozen proteins are known. Here. And it looks, when we tag those proteins on the end terminus, and sh they should be mislocalized, they are not. They go where they should. 
So there seems to be a dedicated, specialized, beautiful import uh, machinery or, or uh, import mechanism that takes care only of those proteins, only in this side of the big reticulated mitochondria. And we will, of course, explore that further. So the conclusions are, the TripTech project localized over 90% of T. brucei proteins anywhere within the cell, and being only the second such effort on a genome-wide scale after yeast, uh, and about 1,200 proteins, uh, one way or another, make it into the mitochondria. But the vast majority of mitochondrial proteins is imported via, as expected, the terminal uh, import uh, signal or target peptides, Yet we have also identified a novel subset of proteins that use different import signals. We have reconstructed several pathways, and uh, we dare to say this study represents the most comprehensive effort to date uh, at resolving the mitoproteome of the proteins. And this work was done uh, by these guys from University of Oxford, and they are uh, very capable technicians. Uh, and the uh, analysis of the data with some also tagging efforts was done in our lab by uh, Jan Pirich or Honza here with the arrow. Uh, he really did a substantial amount of this work and I hope it will end up in a nice story. And Michael Hammond, <coughs> a postdoc uh, that is sitting next to me here to help me if, if there are some difficult questions, uh, also uh, worked uh, hard on this. Here is the funding, and uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Julius. Impressive. <laughs> um, so we have time. We went a bit uh, over time here, so we have time for uh, a couple of. Uh, well, we still have time for a couple of questions. Um, so please raise your hand if you um, have a question. Um, all right, so we have first question by um, Rodolfo here. Rodolfo, can you say your name uh, fully before you ask your question? Okay, sorry. Uh, my name is Rodolfo Souza. I'm from the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, first, Professor Lux, thanks for the presentation. It was impressive, the, <laughs> the level of information that you bring to us. I've been working on trypanosomatids metabolism as well. Um, I have some questions regarding the, the, the proteomic data. Um, that was based on monomorphic or pleomorphic strains for the bloodstream forms. Uh, so the, the proteomic data, uh, that's the middle story, it's combined of all uh, proteomic studies that are available. So it was not one study, uh, but we were um, simply putting all the literature together and supplying it with our data, so it's in both monomorphs and polymorphs. So, uh, uh, so, so it's a little bit of a mixture. Ah, uh, okay. And uh, I have some questions regarding also the the, the RNA editing. I will not make a lot of them, uh, but there is an explanation why parasites kept the kinetoplast and also the RNA editing machinery and the free-living uh, euglenozoa, for example, lacks this pathway. Uh, what kind of uh, uh, good thing the, the, the RNA editing machinery, which is really expensive for the parasites, uh, uh, was the reason to cap them in, in, in treponosomatids, for example? Okay, well, uh, so uh, no, it's uh, RNA editing is not associated with uh, uh, the parasitic lifestyle. Uh, that was the idea of uh, Pete Borst, but uh, all the data within the last, let's say, 20 years disproved it. Uh, there is editing and all the editing machinery in the free living bodo and in other kinetoplastids. Uh, the, the, the whole Editing complexity is present in all kinetoplastic proteins, regardless of their lifestyle. So there is no, uh, let's say, value edit uh, that editing would provide uh, for the for those uh, bugs that decided to get parasitic. Now, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Rodolfo. Um, so next in line we have uh, Jillian Jill. Um, Julian, you can ask your question. 
Okay, thanks, Fabian. Hi, Julius. Hi, um, how are you? I, so this tripartite attachment complex is new to me and sounds really interesting. I was curious whether um, is there the proteins that are imported in this way are they sort of clustered in one functional area or and also is this something that you think is really unique to trips or is this something we might find as an alternate you know import machinery across more eukaryotes? Uh, it it looks so they are in one particular location. Okay, uh, which connects, you can see the fibrils actually connect the basal body and they cross the mitochondrial, both uh, mitochondrial membranes and they attach to the kinetoplast. Uh, so they, they correlate the division of the cell, the flagellum and the mitochondrial DNA disk in this way. And the proteins that are Low, that are considered to be part of the tripartite attachment complex. As I said, it's about one dozen of them. Uh, they localize only to this side, and uh, they they had no uh, let's say common uh, feature. Uh, they seem to be um, simply dedicated to this job evolutionary. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, when you mess up with the N terminals import signal of a mitochondrial protein, it stays in the cytoplasm, it gets degraded, it gets mislocalized. But when you do this for this tripartite attachment complex, they actually move to the right position. So they seem not to use the N-terminal um, press sequence, but some other import signal and, and that makes them to stand out. But, but they are pretty unique. No homologs outside kinetoplastids, unfortunately. Uh, again, some kind of uh, uh, oddity of, of this group. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, we'll take one more question from Erin, Eric Linton. Um, Eric, go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, two quick questions. One, uh, do you think the mitochondrial proteins and euglenoids specifically, do they seem, or if you looked at this or the other groups have a single or multiple origins? I've done the work on the chloroplast genes, and some of them come from different origins, red algae, et cetera, so those are chloroplasts. Do you see any mixture of mitochondrial genes from different origins or putting together, especially maybe in the euglenoids, if you've looked at that, or any thoughts on that? And I have one more short question after that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, uh, uh, that's a good question. You haven't looked into that uh, at all. So uh, I cannot say whether the composition will be uh, let's say evolutionary uh, origin of the mitoproteum, if it will be different from, uh, from other uh, mitochondria, Mark, Ma Mike Gray did uh, some studies on that. Uh, I cannot answer that question. We did not explore that aspect of it. I didn't think so. I just didn't have any thoughts. Second one was when you were talking about the different um, proteins and not being able to find some of the proteins in the free living, trypanosome and uh, not being able to locate them, but you find them in mass spec. Could it be that the proteins, uh, it's not that they really have to like said, ramp up or where are they? Could they just be folded differently when they're in outside the body and then the tsetse fly as opposed to in the blood, the proteins are there, but they're folded differently. Therefore, the antibodies can't find them because the epitope the antibodies are attaching to are now hidden. And then when they change uh -huh. environments, the proteins refold. Okay, that's uh, uh, one possibility. I dare to consider it unlikely because it was done on denatured, under denatured conditions. Uh, those um, in many cases are small proteins where I would not expect them. They, they migrate uh, easily. Uh, we do pretty rough um, boiling. Uh, so um, I would rather, <laughs> Even if, if they would not enter the gel, we would probably see some signal in the slot. Uh, so, uh, or, or if this was the case, I would expect it in some kind of long, uh, uh, long pro big proteins with many uh, transmembrane domains to behave in this manner. But, but we have many subunits, small subunits of respiratory complexes and so on. So uh, I would rather uh, believe that this is a, a, a situation where you have such a tiny amount that the antibody at hand does not see it, rather than uh, different folding of the protein. 
but I cannot exclude that possibility. It's a good one. Oh, thank you. Very good. Right. Thanks. Um, so, um, well, thanks again, Julius. Um, this is mind blowing. <laughs> um, so, but it's time to move on now uh, with our, our last speaker before the coffee break. So, Julius, if you if you can uh, unshare yeah. your screen, sure, sure, th that we can uh, ask Ben to share his screen. So, Ben Larson from the University of California, San Francisco, and Berkeley, and he will talk about regulation of form in multicellular coenoflagellates and evolutionary cell biology or, or of morphogenesis. Right. As I ben, get as I get this uh, going, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for putting together such a wonderful conference. Uh, and then also, I really want to express my gratitude to uh, a lot of people in the protistology community. I've seen many of you here for teaching me uh, so many interesting things about protist, protistology, and doing field work. Um, I found it to be a, a very friendly uh, and awesome community, so thanks for that. Uh, normally, I'd have some mesmerizing videos to share on this opening slide, but they seem to have crashed Zoom. Uh, so I guess I'll just jump right into the talk. Um, and to introduce perhaps a bit of a different perspective, I'd like to emphasize first that in a multicellular context, proper morphogenesis crucially relies on the regulated interplay between cellular behavior and physical constraints. And a really nice example of just what I'm talking about comes from uh, the formation of villi, these finger-like protrusions in the gut that absorb nutrients. Uh, and what you see here is two panels. There's uh, simulations on top and histological sections on the bottom. And it was really by integrating an understanding of the differential growth of different cell layers, this different cell behaviors in conjunction with physical mechanisms like wrinkling and buckling, uh, that a, a complete picture of this long observed uh, stereotypical uh, process of morphogenesis really, really came to be achieved. And animals, of course, have these uh, incredible capacities through developmental processes to develop from a single cell uh, to complex multicellular forms, in the case, you know, this uh, steelhead here is demonstrating unique animal characteristics of having a big, uh, flexible body capable of moving around to find food in its environment. And while we're gaining an increasingly detailed and sophisticated understanding of all sorts of developmental processes, we know comparatively little about how complex multicell multicellularity evolved uh, uh, from, you know, unicellular ancestors. And, and Yaki did a great job of setting the stage uh, for thinking about how uh, the origin of, of development in animals uh, is, is more or less sort of a, a, the, of the origin of, of animals themselves. Uh, and of course, it's a difficult question to answer. How did animals evolve from unicellular ancestors? And like uh, in Yaki's group, uh, during my PhD, I worked with uh, Nicole King in, in the King Lab studies coenoflagellates, the closest real living relatives of animals. And this by comparing uh, uh, the, rel the biology of coenoflagellates with that of animals, uh, we can uh, reconstruct what their last common ancestor uh, might have looked like. Uh, and it turns out coenoflagellates give us quite a bit of, of biology to work with. They're uh, as ancient and diverse as animals. And this is a result from uh, Dan Richter and, and others. And while you can see this sort of uh, diversity of extracellular ornamentation, the diversity is a bit belied by the, the uh, common cell morphology that we see in coenoflagellates, which is the cell body you can see here. And this apical collar complex. It's these actin-filled microvilli that sort of form a funnel around an apical flagellum. And the coenos used that uh, flagellum to propel themselves through the water, but also to capture bacterial prey. You can see these dark spots on the collars of these coenoflagellates that they, they eat the bacteria voraciously. And so this video that Inyaki also showed really got me hooked on coenoflagellates. And what you're seeing is clonal development. So starting from a single cell, uh, uh, S. rosetta, this coenoflagellate is, is building this rosette colony. So it's this three-dimensional structure with the cells all stuck together around the central region. And the main piece of sort of uh, molecularly mechanistic understanding that we have is this basal ECM seems to be quite important. So there's actually ECM sort of filling this central region. And what you see in cyan here is, is rosetteless, a C-type lectin. Uh, and, and the gene rosetteless is actually required for, for proper rosette formation. And this ECM seems to be quite important. So when I started in the lab, what I really wanted to understand is how rosette morphogenesis is robustly achieved, in particular with this eye towards this interplay between physical constraints and active cellular processes. 
And to sort of address this question, I first had to quantitatively characterize rosette development, asking which aspects are actually reproducible. You can imagine in an extreme case, uh, rosettes could develop exactly the same way every single time, following the same cell divisions and building the same shape structure. Uh, and then I could use that to address, you know, what, how, how can we explain these, these uh, patterns that we see. And so to start, I developed a quantitative image analysis pipeline where I'm, uh, I took confocal images of, of rosettes that were gently adhered to a cover slip and I reconstructed this three-dimensional structure uh, and I can fit surfaces through segmentation. So picking an intensity threshold to get the outlines of cells more or less, these are cell bodies here. And then I can extract quantitative information about the shapes of the cells, their packing and also the shapes and sizes of rosettes. And, and I went and, and I staged rosettes by cell number. So what you're seeing here is just uh, three orthogonal views on the same rosette in each uh, column here. And I can ask, how does the structure change size and shape as I add cells to the rosette? And to summarize a lot of work, what I found is there is indeed a stereotyped morphogenetic process in rosette development, where at the four cell stage, you can see that's relatively flat structure, but by the eight cell stage, it has become much more three-dimensional. And it turns out that this is a, a stereotyped a process. You can think of it sort of almost like blowing up a balloon where you have this relatively flat thing at first that's changing shape a bunch. By the time it's, you know, inflated partially, uh, it then hits this point where it sort of grows isotropically swelling. And so in contrast to the stereotyped morphogenetic process, I found that the dynamics of development were actually variable. So there's stochasticity in the order and timing of cell division, but not synchronous or anything like that. Uh, so the task then is to reconcile, we have the stochasticity in developmental dynamics with stereotypy in uh, morphogenic progression. So I ha hypothesized perhaps this ECM is constraining the growth of cells. Uh, and when I measured the amount of ECM, it's actually maintained at a small constant amount uh, relative to the amount of cells through all stages of rosette development. And the physical picture is, is more or less this. So they're secreting a small amount of ECM, the cells grow and they push on one another. And this ECM sort of resists that pushing and maybe the cells are able to reorient, but eventually you may reach this stage where the cells have filled in sort of all of the available surface area. And so when any cell is growing, it's pushing on all of its neighbors and they're sort of uh, pushing one another out of the rosette almost competing for space on the central ECM blob. And it turns out this hypothesis gives us very specific predictions about the uh, distribution of stresses in growing rosettes. Uh, and in contrast to other hypotheses that you might imagine, for example, strong cell-cell adhesion. And we can actually test this uh, stress distribution. And now this is in collaboration with uh, Stacy Lee of the Sanjay Kumar lab at Berkeley. And uh, what we did is laser ablation. And the idea is we zap a cell, we blow it up in the rosette uh, with a laser and uh, watch what happens to the structure of the rosette after ablation. And any movement that we see is actually a readout uh, of, of the distribution of stresses. So the velocity of movements are proportional to the stress uh, and the direction shows us the direction of the stress. And what we saw was actually consistent with predictions of this ECM constraint. So in this video, we ablate this cell here. Not much happens. This is a five cell rosette. It's relatively small. But in contrast, if we look at this large rosette, a 12 cell rosette, we're gonna ablate this cell here. There's much bigger movement. So these arrows, these green arrows are just giving us velocities of movement. And remember those are proportional to the stresses. And indeed we saw that as you increase in cell number, you have increasing residual stress. So this is consistent with that ECM constraint hypothesis. Then we can go further and actually formalize. So I have this sort of physical intuition of how, how uh, ECM might constrain the growth of cells. We can formalize with a very simplified model uh, our, our physical assumptions about growth. And so what you see here is a, a cell represented by these linked particles. And in our simulations, the cells interact sterically, so they just take up space and push on one another. Uh, the cells can grow and divide. They can also secrete ECM represented by these little particles here, and this ECM is sticky. And we really have three main parameters that describe this system. There's one for cell shape, so how long and skinny the cell is, another for the amount of ECM that they're secreting before division, and then another that scales the ECM stiffness relative to how hard the cells push on one another. And what I was surprised to find is that when we constrain these parameters by measurements that we can make as, as best as we can get uh, from S Rosetta, we actually recapitulate Rosette morphogenesis where we even get this 3D growth transition at the eight cell stage but we can also explore parameter space. And I was very surprised to find that even with this very simplified picture of rosette morphogenesis, we get a diversity of shapes uh, uh, just based on scaling these uh, biophysical parameters. 
And what's more is, is, is these are reminiscent of forms of coanaflagellates that we actually find in nature. And so our model actually gives us a way to go out now out and look at these different coanaflagellates and we can make measurements to see if, if, if we really are hitting the predicts, predictions correctly based on this, this simplified picture. So this uh, uh, was recently published uh, uh, in PNAS and uh, uh, I, I was really excited about this result because it, it's the story about how the regulated basal secretion of ECM is really important for sculpting multicellular morphology. And this is sort of a principle that we can see in animals, in bacteria, and also in other sorts of protists. And I think uh, studying uh, these kinds of morphogenetic processes more broadly, uh, and, and also studying the, the composition and regulation of the ECM in coanos gives us a lot of uh, interesting directions to, to go on. Furthermore, uh, uh, it's nice that I have this sort of more biophysical perspective that independently arrived at similar conclusions to these more molecular studies that implicated the importance of the basal ECM. And now to move on to another uh, super exciting story that's probably the, the uh, luckiest thing that will ever happen to me in my scientific career. Uh, first of all, I was uh, lucky enough to get to do field work in Curaçao. And this is all work that was done in collaboration with amazing collaborators, uh, Tess Linden and Thibaut Brunet. And we were look, looking at the diversity of coanoflagellates around Curaçao and we scooped a splash pool like this. And here's what we saw when we looked under the microscope at our sample. This is a colony of coanoflagellates. These dots are the cells. And there's this dramatic shape change that this colony undergoes. So what you're looking at is sort of a cup that's facing away from you on a cover slip. And its friend comes and sits down next to it. And we saw these dramatic shape changes. Uh, uh, and here and now the cells are sort of contracting. And what you're actually seeing is the inversion of curvature of the, of the cup. So like a rubber popper toy, if you know these things, uh, flips itself inside out, back and forth like that. So you can see it's a, a cup-shaped colony that swims away. And unlike all the other coanoflagellates that I told you about uh, in the last portion of the talk, there actually doesn't seem to be substantial basal ECM holding these things together. It's really collar-collar adhesion that, that's, that's mediating the sort of uh, structural integrity of, of the uh, colonies. And if we take a section through uh, the collar of these coanoflagellates, if we look in EM, we can see the microvilli. So microvilli here, flagellum here, they're really sort of closely paired together. So it's 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 cell-cell adhesion. And I'll talk about these two different conformations of, of the colonies. There's flagella in, where this colony is more expanded and the flagella are pointing inward on the curvature, surface of curvature, and flagella out where it's more compact and the flagella are pointing outward. Then you are you're at 12 minutes already. Just Okay, to... all right. So, <laughs> I'll very quickly finish up here. Apologies for going so long. Um, okay, oh, so it turns out that the coanoflagellate colonies respond to light. Uh, this is another lucky finding. Uh, and you can see these, these are all colonies here. And when the light goes off, they contract and they move much faster in the light. And this differential swimming speed actually allows them to accumulate in, in regions uh, of, of light and sort of avoid uh, the darkness because they swim slower in, in the light compared to the darkness. I don't have time to talk about a uh, beautiful work that Tess Linden did, but she showed that there's this unique uh, coanoflagellate rhodopsin PD fusion uh, 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 that mediates the light sensing. Okay, and so I think I'll, I'll probably just sort of uh, wrap things up here, uh, but it turns out these, these coanoflagellates are transitioning between uh, these two states, uh, this flagella in expanded form that's slow swimming and it actually feeds very well. It can draw on a substantial feeding current uh, compared to this flagella out form that swims rapidly. Uh, 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 but does not feed well. So it's sort of mediating this trade-off and, and it's converting direct mechanical stimulus into these uh, shape changes. Okay, so uh, uh, finally, uh, sorry, I don't have a chance to actually talk about this finding, but uh, the big result here, one of the big results is that it, it turns out there's this apical actomyosin contractile complex, the cellular module that's involved in mediating these shape changes. And we actually find that uh, uh, that uh, many different coanoflagellates have actomyosin uh, apical contractility. Um, and so we infer from that that this apical contractility probably, in, uh, which is involved in, in, we don't really know what in other coanoflagellates and is involved in developmental processes in animals probably evolved before the origin of animals. Um, okay, and since I uh, ran out of time, I'll, I'll skip through and just uh, thank- Jesus Christ, Ben. <laughs> Okay, so I'll, I'll thank uh, all of the people who were involved in the work that I shared and also for you for uh, listening to this talk. Okay. Um, thank you, Ben. Um, sorry for rushing you. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> um, I think we'll, we'll, we're running late.
It's so we'll have time to take one question. We have Omaya uh, Dud in here who wants to ask you a question. So we'll uh, take him and then we'll go to coffee break. Omaya. Thanks, Valen. Thanks, uh, Ben, for the talk. I had actually two questions, but I'm just going to ask one. Uh, it's about the laser ablation experiment. I was wondering what's the contribution of the intracellular bridges? Yeah. And did you try, for instance, to laser ablate just the bridges and see how that affects your compaction? Yeah, so, so it turns out um, we, we can't actually see those uh, bridges with the confocal microscopy that we're using. They're very, very tiny. Uh, and I'll just say that, that if sort of bridge tension were uh, the dominant uh, physical contribution, uh, I would expect actually stresses to be in the opposite direction. So they're building up tension in the bridges. They're getting stretched. So then if you cut this thing, you'd actually expect the colony to open up. So the yeah. relaxation of the colony would have been in, in, the, in the opposite sort of direction. Um, and we really don't know much about the function uh, of these bridges, and it would be great to learn more. Um, but for now, since we don't have any really molecular markers, um, we, we sort of have to look at them in, in electron microscopy. But uh, it's a good question. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, OK, so it's time for our uh, coffee break now. But before we break into um, the different rooms, uh, Patrick Killing had a, an announcement. I'll, I'll keep this really brief. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, first is um, we're going to keep the live stream going through the coffee break because yesterday it uh, generated a new link after we stopped it. So if you are in breakout room number eight with Javi Del Campo, I just want to let you know that your coffee break will be live streamed on YouTube. So just so you know, if you wish to uh, leave that room because that you're not comfortable with that, you can ask to have yourself reassigned to a different room. The other thing is I'm gonna do a little bit of an experiment here and I'm gonna open up the uh, registration further to see if we can uh, let more people that have that are on the wait list into the meeting. If you happen to notice that the, con that the number of people in the participants list goes up close to 300, then it's possible if you have a meeting, you won't be able to get back in because if it goes up to 300, you will be, uh, you'll be blocked. And I have posted the link to the YouTube simulcast uh, in the chat. So if you happen to leave the meeting and can't get back in, which I doubt will happen, uh, you can always go to the uh, YouTube room and try back later. All right, so the coffee break was really popular yesterday. I encourage everyone to accept the invitation you're about to get and go into a breakout room, grab a coffee from behind you or whatever, and uh, maybe meet some new people. The recording has stopped. Hi, Thomas. Hi, Abby. Oh, hey, YouTube. Awkward. Hi, YouTube. <laughs> How's it going? Oh, Corey's here, too. What? I am just dropping in. I'm curious to see how many people are in these rooms because there should be 10 to 12. Or seven. How's it going? It's going well. 8 a.m. starts a little early, but I suppose that's what you get at a normal conference. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, we had to make it convenient for as many people as we could. Obviously, yeah. No, it's been uh, lots of fun. Thanks for organizing. No problem. I'm just randomly assigning other people to breakout rooms here. Oh, Javi, quick question. What, what are you using to live stream? It sounds really complicated what you're doing. <laughs>
I hope they can see the slides. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to join a different room. I'm bouncing around a bit. Hey, hey Patrick. Check out my SoundCloud. No. <laughs> Find me at MySpace. Mm -hmm. Hey. <laughs> Just me, it's just me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So do you want to tell us uh, where you're at, Luciana, and what you're working on? Yeah, well, um, I just finished my PhD on test state amoeba. Mm -hmm. And I did that in Argentina. I'm from Argentina. Oh, nice. And now I'm in the in the States in in Missouri at the botanical garden in missouri uh well looking to apply for a postdoc so planning on a new project mm -hmm. That's cool. yeah hello how is it going i'm fine i'm fine thank you how are you <laughs> So just maybe I will just introduce myself too for those who don't know me yet. So I'm I'm Sasha from uh, Saint Petersburg from Russia, and I work at the Zoological Institute of Russian Academy of Science, and now I have my lab there since last year. So we work on uh different uh several different topics in protestology mainly biodiversity phylogeny of different uh different groups so my main um, uh, group is amoeba zoa oh, um yeah pleasure, pleasure to meet you all Hey there. There he is. Oh, there you go. Okay, there you go. Um, yeah, so I'm a new postdoc in the Keeling lab, although I'm not there yet. I'm still in the UK. Uh, but I work on invertebrate microbiomes. So we have a, a myofauna project that we're doing, looking at new inverts and their microbiomes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm Thomas Whalen. I'm at the uh, University of British Columbia, Naomi Fast Lab. I, uh, we study kind of what happens to the spliceosome in reduced systems. And so I study microspiridae in particular, which is why I was so excited to see uh, Puri's talk this morning. It was nice. She was added a little bit late to the uh, lineup. Um, yeah, first of all, Alex Piss has asked me to say hi, Alex. So hi, Alex. I guess he's watching me. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm also in uh, I'm Patrick Keeling's lab, except I am in Vancouver. We'll be meeting Corey soon, hopefully. Um, yeah, and I'm currently working with, I don't know if you guys remember Varsha's talk yesterday. I'm currently working on a project with her, which I'm excited about, with her like cool AP transcriptomes and also did some stuff with parapostalid so
Oh, I don't know. You put me on the spot. <laughs> I'll, I'll do. <laughs> oh, that's nothing. I'm just in my bedroom at home. What does that mean? Uh. Corey, if you want me to let you off the hook, I have an answer to this question. Yeah, go so. for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I'm biased. I, I, my my favorite talk would have been Puri's talk, the first one this morning, and then Varsha's because she's a friend of mine. But uh, Susanna Porter's talk yesterday on early eukaryotic fossils, I thought was really interesting. So that would be my favorite non-biased <laughs> talk thus far. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I'd probably have to pick uh, first. I'd have to say Varsha because she's... <laughs> One, my roommate, and she's like in the room next door watching this, probably. Um, but uh, so that doesn't count. But then aside from that, I really liked Ross's talk, actually, with the, the hyperlopis. Uh, that was super cool. I, I thought a lot of new stuff. I think a lot can be done with that. I'm excited. Well, sadly, I couldn't uh, listen to the talks yesterday, so now I have to catch up by YouTube. <laughs> but I was really excited about hearing Susanna's uh, talk because I, I know what she works on and it's really fascinating. Well, actually, I, I I mostly agree with Thomas, and um, I really loved uh, yesterday's talk on uh, uh, integrating paleontology and eukaryogenesis. This was fascinating to me. This was something, you know, something I really, I mean, I didn't, um, um, I, I haven't yet heard, you know, such such an extension, you know, so extensive uh, ideas on this before on the uh, at the meetings. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Say hi to him. Yeah. <laughs> sure, sure. Especially given he's in my lab now. <laughs> hi, everyone. Yeah, Patrick just hey. forced me in here because I was <laughs> laughing so hard after he forced Malash in here. He said, Oh, you think that's funny, Jillian? And then, boom. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> oh, that's a really hard question, Howie. You're you're on record. You're on record. Uh, you're on record, Gillian. So be careful what you're going to say here. <laughs> Don't you think like breakout room eight is like a nice title for a movie? Yeah. <laughs> or for a talk show. And we yeah. can all be stars. <laughs> you know, all of the talks have been so fantastic. What's your favorite, Javi?
Yeah. Not that single cell also, though. My, my students really appreciated that for the same reasons. Yeah, that's great. Okay. <laughs> exactly. I'm being recorded, so I'm already. <laughs> Let's see. I have to think about because they've all been so amazing. Um, but so the problem is that no one has been talking about parabasalia yet, so that's why I'm agnostic. <laughs> I don't think I can give my opinion as an organizer. As an organizer? I, ha I have to stay totally neutral. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you're an organizer too. Let me get my <laughs> No, I mean, I'm not going to, you're not going to trap me. I'm not going to pick anyone. I think, no, I mean, I really liked, I also, well, for the method part, I really, I was, mind blown by by Ross technique. I just wanted to say though that you know you just mentioned single cell. I think the purpose here is is really quite different because this does not work on single cell. So exactly. if you if you if you use single cell technology because you can't use you know billions of cells to do what you want to do then then you can't do what he's doing. So but that said it's absolutely amazing and uh, I really like the way how he connected that to to stuff like evolutionary thinking. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was super super cool um and uh, i mean I, I liked all the talks i was really like ben ben's talk today it's also super cool and i just wanted to hear more but but mm -hmm. but then when i went when i saw that he was just like having 10 more slides and he was already over time i was i need to stop yeah i'm so sorry for that ben if you're listening <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> oh i know i wish we could have heard the whole thing <laughs> yeah is this is this uh, here? Okay, we're returning. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Bye. 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 My system stopped working and I had to get back into it. You're just in the main meeting now. You're just at the top of my list, so I could see you there. Okay, I shall, I'll sh shut my video off then so you can get on with things. Yeah, it's about time to start again here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'll just wait till everybody gets back on board here. Alex, if you wanna put up your first slide, that's probably fine. This meeting is being recorded. If people want to, um, preserve bandwidth, they can turn their cameras off, uh, except maybe the, the various co-hosts, maybe leave yours on for the speakers so that they have live people to see. Can you test your sound, Alex? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah, good. Yeah. All right, I think we're all back. So uh, I'm gonna chair this last uh, short session and the first speaker is Alex Warden. And uh, she's going to be talking about uh, the ecology and evolution of marine protists. Alex. Um, thank you, Patrick. And thanks so much to Javi and Fabian and Patrick for organizing. Um, Patrick, I wanted to double check. Um, we're 15 minutes behind, right? Uh, yeah. OK. Um, so I, it's really exciting to be here. and. Um, see all these talks and exactly what I hope we can do someday, where we really understand how cell biology allows these organisms, these amazing protists to thrive and control biogeochemical cycles in the ocean. Um, so you'll see my talk is coming from a slightly different perspective of how we can just start to connect individual eukaryotic cells, typically uncultured cells with partners in the sea. And, I say partners in quotes because they're not necessarily friendly partners. They're, 
these could be all kinds of relationships, but relationships that involve a physical interaction between cells. So I think everyone here knows that protistin diversity is huge. And um, Patrick always tells me it's nice to have something people know in your talk. So we know this and we've known it for quite a while. And we might think that this image of Ernst Haeckel's is imaginary fantasy, but when we go look at some of these cells, we can say, no, it's not fantasy. They're, they're really remarkable, these protists. But what's been so amazing in the meeting so far is to see um, how people are using this diversity to explore deep questions like the origins of eukaryotes in Susanna Porter's talk yesterday, or the development of multicellularity as we saw earlier today and yesterday in Inaki's talk. Um, and another thing we know very well is that microbial activities drive biogeochemical cycles and they have, of course, throughout the Earth's history, changing our atmosphere to one that's totally oxygenated that allowed us to thrive. Um, and we know that, the, that these activities involve intense interactions in the ocean and these affect how much CO2 is taken up and they affect how much CO2 is removed from the atmosphere into the deep ocean, and, and in, in addition to all the food chains in the oceans. But again, it's asking that question, um, sorry, I just need to hide a few people because they're blocking my slides. Um, how do we identify um, specific interactions that shape productivity patterns and the movement of carbon in the ecosystem? So we've seen in oceanography um, this huge emphasis on co-occurrence analysis to identify interactions. And this has been done even in very recent time using size fractionated filtering of seawater um, where people then can sequence amplicons from those different size fractions or do metagenomic sequencing to capture a mixture of interactions. Um, but they can't, uh, but they can't identify the nature of that interaction using the method. So they might be looking on any individual filter where they say, look, co-occurrence at a pre prey in a predator. Or they might be looking at an ephemeral interaction between cells, um, for example, this representation of a vibrio with a coanoflagellate. Or they might be looking at organisms um, growing or colonizing on detrital material. And again, we can't identify what that interaction is. So I think there's been a really big push really led by protistologists um, to move beyond novel sequence diversity and the inferences we can make based on that. Oh, there's so many things popping up, sorry. Um, uh, and, and really connect to the cell biology behavior and nature of the interactions. So this is an example from Patrick Keeling's um, lab and collaboration. So this is a glass micropipette approach for targeting wild cells of interest and in this case culturing them and doing this full characterization where they could then um, really study this novel unicellular holozoan um, and, and gain insights ranging from ecology and behavior to the evolution of multicellularity. Now, Patrick's lab has also um, done a lot where maybe they can't culture the cell, but they can image it and sequence it and understand more about its evolution. In my lab, we've been chasing these interactions between uncultured entities using slightly different approaches, um, stable isotope probing, where you can use a, a labeled, um, a cell that's been grown with label and then maybe feed it to another cell and trace that label through the system, and fluorescence activated cell sorting or FAC and most recently microfluidics. So in the SIP work, what we're doing is, is growing the organism Prochlorococcus, which is the most abundant photosynthetic organism in the planet. It's a, made, it's a cyanobacterium that's all over the, the tropical, subtropical um, oceans. And um, by growing it in this label, we're then able to separate um, out the DNA from predators that have eaten this cell um, doing RNA SIP. And then we can sequence and find out who is eating Prochlorococcus out there. That's a major link in the food chain that we really want to know about. For fluorescence activated cell sorting, we're typically staining, for example, a food vacuole or maybe the food vacuole and chlorophyll if we want to get at mixotrophic organisms. 
and then sequencing. And again, um, we're now, I'll show you a tiny bit of microfluidics at the end of my talk. So this gives us an anonymous view of wild cells. We don't have to know any sequence information before we capture these cells. So far, we've been using it in a destructive mode, but some of these methods, especially the facts, could be used in a non-destructive way if you then went into culturing. Um, and so let's turn then to the ocean. So we go out there and we sequence the ribosomal RNA gene. This is the 18S gene. And here we'll look at one particular group, the, photos, the chrysophytes, which are photosynthetic algae. Um, and you can see that most of these organisms are uncultured. We just have this tremendous amount of diversity in the uncultured groups. And we're working at a really important region of the ocean that's thought to represent what future oceans will look like because it's so intensely stratified that nutrients don't penetrate to the surface. Um, and that's connected to what we think warmer oceans will look like. And so the question is, that's an environment where someone like Prochlorococcus really thrives. So how are these eukaryotic larger cells that could never really compete for nutrients with someone like Prochlorococcus how are they hacking it out there? So how do they compete with a smaller alga in a low nutrient ocean? So we can look to try to understand, first of all, which of these uncultured guys are out there at bats. And what you can see here, we're looking at amplicon relative sequence, relative abundance. And you're looking at, um, across, you're looking at different dates across the X. You're looking at a period called deep mixing in the winter and a stratified period I have the waiting room popping up. Um, and you can see which groups actually matter out in this oligotrophic setting. And, oh, I can't, okay, sorry. Um, and I want to show you then the guy that we have in culture where we can sort of study the biology of photosynthetic chrysophytes um, is, is really quite distinct, quite different phylogenetically from these taxa. Um, now, when we go into, we see that in other environments, these same uncultured groups are important. You can see this in the Eastern Pacific shown on the left. And when we do the RNA SIP, what we see is that this uncultured clade E is a predatory alga that's actively eating. So this is something we didn't know about its biology. It's a consumer of the abundant cyanobacterium prochlorococcus. And this shifts our view of ecosystem roles and interactions. This organism is not solely doing photosynthesis, it's also a consumer in the system. And then it's about figuring out what's the balance between how much photosynthesis it's doing and how much it's eating out there in terms of where we put it in food web models. Now we can turn to cell sorting at C. Um, and here we're gonna pass cells single file past a laser and then separate them based on whatever characteristic it is we're interested in. In this case, we're typically staining cells and looking at, at cells with food vacuoles. And then we're going to analyze these and whatever other particles or entities or bacteria are co-associated with them as a cohesive unit. Now, the first time we started doing this at sea, you know, I just bought this fancy cell sorter for $800,000. And here it is hanging over the ocean. You can't see the water. Uh, the crane driver didn't seem to, I don't know if it was my gender or what was going on, but wasn't too interested in hearing about delicate optics. And you start wondering, well, does the university insurance policy cover this thing if it falls in the ocean right now? So far, um, we haven't had to figure that one out, um, but we've used this then to chase unicellular predators, including mixotrophs anonymously. So we have this opportunity to find which predatory protists out there are really important, let's say. So we can go and culture protists from the ocean and they may or not be the ones that are most important at any moment in time in terms of actively feeding. So what you're looking at here is data from the flow cytometer. On the x-axis, you're looking at forward angle light scatter, which is a representation of cell size. On the y-axis, you're looking at green fluorescence coming from food vacuole. So these cells have a stained food vacuole. And then what we've done is um, we're looking at chlorophyll fluorescence and what you can see sort of up above the line that says true chlorophyll fluorescence are some, some of the cyanobacteria and other photosynthetic eukaryotes in the system. 
And we're going to say, we don't want anything that has a signal in the sort. And when we then look and see who these different cells are by sequencing, we found that in this particular sort, 99% of the cells were this uncultured guanaflagellate by Costa. Um, and then we just a couple other entities. So we've already heard all about planoflagellates with much more beautiful, well, I shouldn't say that because this is actually from Nicole, but it's from Nicole a while ago. And what you can see is um, that these organisms, of course, are among the closest living relatives, unicellular relatives of animals. And in our lab, we've been finding mounting evidence that they're really important oceanic predators. So um, we see a high frequency of quantiflagellates in sorts of cells with active food vacuoles. So not just any sequence that might be assigned to a predator, but really things that were actively feeding. And our RNA stable isotope probing experiments show major incorporation of labeled prey cells by quantiflagellates, even out in bluer water where quantos haven't really been thought to be very important. Let's look now at the inner world of uncultured, of this uncultured planoflagellate. Um, so we're going to use single cell sorting and um, multiple, am multiple displacement amplification sequencing and genome assembly. So first of all, we have this organism by Costa Minor, again, an uncultured planoflagellate in 99% of the wells that had HNS ribosomal RNA sequence. And what we found here was this divergent gamma proteobacterium in the same wells. We think it has a complete genome based on um, single copy universal genes. It has a very small genome of one megabase. Um, and it has all the signatures of a pathogen, which of course could also mean it's a symbiont. And that's something we still have to work on. But some of the dynamics we're seeing suggest more of, of the role of a pathogen. Um, and so this is really. Um, something that we don't think about right now in the ocean. I mean, we should, but we don't really think about predatory protists being controlled by bacterial pathogens out there. So it's a, it's a piece of that isn't in the diagram quite yet. Um, and then the other thing we found in these cells is a giant virus. So giant viruses um, are sort of defined by having a genome that's greater than 300 KB in size. And you can see here on the left, Mimi virus, and in comparison, some viruses that you might be more familiar with. Um, and these viruses really blur the line with cellular life. They have complex metabolic repertoires, they have translational proteins, they have photolyases, they have so many neat features um, that we typically associate with, with cellular life. Now, there are many uncultured viruses out there. We, we see this from very early polymerase, the, um, uh, Whole B sequencing, which is one of the genes you sort of can PCR out from, from viruses um, because it's sort of conserved enough to semi decent primers. And then from metagenomic data mining and sequencing and assembly of aquatic giant viruses. So, you know, the first Mimi virus papers came out about a decade ago saying these are just these tremendous, um, tremendously large viruses and maybe gave that maybe they're hints to how eukaryotes arose. Um, and since then, there are quite a number of assemblies that have been done. But what's interesting about that is that because they're metagenomic, really their true hosts are not clear. Um, so in most cases, we don't know who the true hosts are. So it's neat, we have this amazing virus, but we can't attach that to the ecology that's going on in the system. So let's take a look at this guy. So what you can see here is a version of the eukaryotic tree and you see um, our virus in the star uh, that infects guanaflagellates. Now, in terms of other marine um, giant viruses that infect a known, have a known host, the marine predatory protists, we really just have the cafeteria virus here. Um, and there are many other giant viruses known, and these are, many of them um, come from algae, uh, and, and then the one from the kinetoplastids um, that Curtis Suttles lab has really followed up on and, and learned a lot about. Okay, now what's really interesting about the virus that we've discovered is that it has three microbial rhodopsins. Um, now, microbial rhodopsins are only known from one other virus that has a known host. This is a virus um, PGV, 
which can protect the alga phaeocystis, which is very important in the Southern Ocean, and also makes really gross stuff on beaches in Northern Europe. Um, and then there are many other putatively viral versions of these rhodopsins that have been found in metagenomes, but again, with no connection to an actual um, rest of a viral genome or a host. Um, and microbial rhodopsins, of course, have lots of different functions, but some, some of the ones that are, um, we all think about are proton pumps, ion pumps, sodium pumps, and we've already heard about some sensory rhodopsins today. And what was exciting in oceanography is that in 2000, they found that there were quite widespread bacteria that had these rhodopsins, and they showed that this rhodopsin could be used in a phototrophic mode. So not using inorganic carbon, but allowing these organisms to pump protons um, and, and perform phototrophy. And what they could show is that uh, this proton pumping in heterotrophic bacteria prolonged survival during starvation if light was available. So they're really allowing this organism to use light energy. Now, when we look at the coronavirus um, and, the, and the other putatively viral rhodopsins, we see that they're really quite distant from characterized microbial rhodopsins. And um, you can see the only other one with a known host is this one from the phaeocystis um, virus, BGV. And I want to just point out that here are some of the coenoflagellate rhodopsins. So these, again, are, are quite distinct from the viral rhodopsins that are known, um, but from the viral rhodopsins that we're looking at in pink. So they're divergent. Are they functional? Um, so this is a really important question because probably all of us here must love Dumbledore. I'm not sure, but um, maybe 90%. Um, it's not just the genes you have, but the way you choose to use them. So what is this divergent viral rhodopsin really doing uh, in these cells? So the first thing we were able to do with Japanese collaborators is is, um, is chain the crystal structure, and it's the first viral rhodopsin crystal structure that's been um, uh, characterized. And expression in E. coli shows that this sphere R in one of the versions in the coronavirus acts as a light driven proton pump. Um, and what we could see is what we can see is that um, it also has. Sorry, I keep getting things across the top that make me not see my slides, so that's why I'm hesitating. But, um, but how would the coronavirus get the required chromophore retinol? Now, we've learned from Nicole King's group that actually they can get it from their diet. They can get beta carotene through their diet um, and use this in association with rhodopsins. When we look at the, the PGV virus, which infects an alga, what we see is the host has all the genes to synthesize beta carotene that's then cleaved to retinol and used in association with this rhodopsin to collect light and pump protons, or we think. Um, and then we can look at the planoflagellates and what we see is they have the first two steps that are associated with other pathways, but they don't have any of the later steps that would take them to beta carotene. And we see though that the virus has all of those genes. So it's bringing the whole pathway and when we look out at the field at transcript, at transcript data, metatranscript data, we see that all of these genes are expressed in the field. So the coronavirus itself encodes the entire rhodopsin photosystem, um, VRR pigment and the cleavage enzyme, VRR DTS pumps protons. So we can ask, do we have virally driven photoheterotrophy in a predatory eukaryotic host? And we still need to demonstrate localization and function in the host. And the really sad thing is, of course, the virus is not cultured and the clinoflagellate is not cultured. Um, so there's uh, going to take some creativity to fix that. But the reason this is so important is that there's emerging evidence that microbial rhodopsins are major contributors to solar energy captured in the sea. And so to what extent um, is even beta carotene that we measure in the sea and currently attribute to phytoplankton and rhodopsin contributions in the ocean actually from viruses of protists as opposed to being algal or bacterial. How much solar energy capture is by vero cells? Um, and we've then followed up doing lots more sorting. And what we can see is that we just have this whole diversity of viruses to dig into that we're getting out of these protists and sorts. 
Um, in this case, what we see that the eukaryotes that we're really getting in this sort are fungi, um, but the viruses we're getting really associate with known phytoplankton viruses. So we wonder if what we're seeing are fungi on an active phyto algae, sort of a whole little ecosystem on its own. But the other thing we've been able to show is that other coronaviruses have this BRR gene. So this is a fairly widespread attribute uh, in these viruses. So accounting- Just, just yeah? to, that's 21 minutes, just so you know. Yes, okay, I'm almost there. So um, I think one of the things we need to think about is, you know, out in the ocean, things are dilute and being lytic may not be very attractive. So is there a transient mutualism between viruses and hosts through photoheterotrophy? How transient is a virostate cell in nature? Could these kind of shift the trophic mode of the planoflagellate as maybe predation becomes more difficult for it? And I just want to end by saying that craning facts onto ships, yeah, it's actually not that fun. And driving uh, going to Curacao, uh, where Pat finally organized uh, several science meetings, um, packing up our instrument and driving it over what turned out to be the septic system, which stressed everyone really out a lot, um, is just not super fun. So the thing we've been working on now is trying to use microfluidics, where we're able to encapsulate cells um, in water uh, in an oil emulsion, and then go through these different steps to finally get to a lower cost, um, much higher cell count um, sampling of cells in the ocean. And this is actually data from bacteria, but what you see is something to do with completeness of those bacterial genomes. And then what you can see in the bottom panels along the X, you're looking at 815 different cells. I just wanna highlight that you have SAR-11, this very abundant heterotrophic bacterium. And then what we can say is we think we're seeing several new viruses associated with that cell. Now there's lots to do to iron this out and we've only tried it once on protistin cells and there's a long way to go, but I think it has a lot of promise. Um, so there are many other sort-based interactions that we could talk about another day. We've looked at prey and predators through the, the, photo, the chrysophytes that are eating. We've looked at, um, pathogens in a predatory host, just briefly, and viruses, my thing is not advancing, um, viruses in a host. And then finally, we think we're starting to be able to see this whole little ecosystem of a detrital alga after infection um, being colonized by fungi. And with that, I wanna thank everyone in my lab. It's just a really amazing group um, and Several of them have weathered this move to Germany, which has been interesting, um, and, and all of you for your attention. Thank you. Thanks. So we have a few minutes for questions. If people could raise their electronic hands, please. <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna ask one to start while people are getting figuring that out. Okay. With the um, quantiflagellate interest, uh, the bacteria associated with the quantiflagellate, how how do you take steps to distinguish between a, an actual pathogen that does harm versus just a freeloader that just is a good symbiont? Well, it's very highly replicated in the cell. So, I mean, that, that feels like a burden, but that might be very humanistic of me to think that way. Mm -hmm. um, we see type four secretion systems, again, that could be related to symbiotic event. Uh, Relationship. We see patterns in the environment that look like as the host comes up, we only have this thing in the in the very small size fraction. And then um, when the host collapses, the population collapses, we see many more of these um, pathogen or putative pathogen like sequences in a larger size fraction, indicative that they're they're associated with that collapsing population. But it's all right now. Again, it's another thing where you've got the wild pathogen and the wild host. And I think there's a lot of fluorescence in hybridization to be done. Okay. How are we doing? We're running a little late. So, if, so oh, Fabian? Can I, you, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah, it's about, <laughs> it's too bad you had to um, 
move over the microfluidics so quickly, but I'm just uh, sure. really curious. Uh, well, maybe, maybe can you can you tell us a little bit more about that? So, so you, so do you do this at at sea? No, you you take back the no. samples. So, and, yeah. Well, so far, um, you know, we, we started out with the protist sample, and then you know, it ended up with problems at a stage where we weren't expecting problems, and just and it was such a precious sample, right? Because you go out there and you collect. So we decided we'll shift to bacteria where we just it's just a lot easier right because of the concentrations um and so one of the things we're kind of wondering about now is stickiness so even though you're in this emulsion um just because a virus is associated with the cell does that mean it was actually going to infect that cell or or is there a stickiness thing going on so david's been spending a lot of time thinking about that and then so how do you make sure that that the interaction you're seeing is really truly related to a physically intentioned, as you describe it, relationship. And I think statistics will help a lot there, you know, with frequency you see it, or if these are two rare entities and you're finding them together all the time, then you can quite easily say, oh, well, this is a two, this has to be meaningful because there's no way these could ever bump into each other because they're so rare um, mm -hmm. in the water. Um, and we do see that. That's one of our confidence building factors. Cool. Thanks. Nice. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Alex. Um, I think we're getting ready for the last talk. Can you please unshare your screen? Yeah. And Yana, can you please share your screen? All right. The last talk of the Symposium is going to be from Yana Eglett from Dalhousie University, and she's going to talk about a new lineage of protists that she's characterized. Yana. Event. It's very nice seeing everyone and hearing about protists. Um, so I'm a PhD student in the lab of Alistair Simpson at Dalhousie University in Halifax. And today I would like to talk to you about a couple exciting organisms we've been working on lately. And normally I gesture with my hands, so I'm gonna to try to uh, replace the gesturing with the pointer um, that I hope people can see. Is it good? Okay. Um, so the vast majority of eukaryotic diversity, at least from our perspective, is protestin, that is, it lies outside the classical kingdoms of fungi, animals, and land plants. And over, over the past few decades, it has coalesced into a handful of supergroups um, here indicated in different colors, um, it, which are one of the kind of informal organizing units of uh, eukaryotic diversity. And each of these supergroups involve a very vast and varied um, collection of organisms that differ from each other substantially. And they, as an example of this, um, epistacons have come up in a couple talks earlier in this series. And not only do epistacons feature um, the classical kingdoms, animals, and fungi, but also bewildering variety of protestant lineages mingling with them. And this is in fact quite characteristic of a so-called supergroup. So these supergroups often don't share any um, obvious uh, physical characteristic, but have in, ter in turn been actually assembled through molecular sequence analyses. And what is missing from these trees of molecular sequences are organisms for which there exists none, for which we have no uh, molecular information, often because they were, for example, never cultured or otherwise unseen. So one example of such a group um, are the hemimastigotes, which have a very peculiar, unusual uh, morphology consisting of two rows of flagella. Um, they've been known since the 19th century, but there has, not only could they not be easily placed anywhere by morphology, they, uh, there was no culture and no molecular sequence data available. So a couple of years ago, we were able to use single cell methods to obtain molecular sequences. 
And it turned out that not only do these hemimastigophora not go in any previously established supergroup, shown here in color, but seem to form a distinct deep lineage in their own right. So going back to the tree shown earlier, they, um, they fell outside the previously established groups. So today I will talk about two more organisms for which there were no prior molecular sequence data available. So the first of them is Meteora. Meteora was described in 2002 from an enrichment set up from a deep sea sample. And there was no opportunity to cultivate the organism or to obtain molecular sequence data. And it has a very peculiar morphology that was hard to believe at the time almost, um, which consists of a long axis along which the cell glides um, and two or more arm-like protrusions that swing back and forth as the organism glides along the surface. And about a couple decades later, independently, um, <clears throat> there have been two isolates and two cultures established of this organism um, at the same um, time, at almost at the same time. And so I want to point out that this project is actually in eco collaboration with Takashi Shiratori in, um, in Japan. Um, so, oops, um, so the, despite the appealing appearance, the arms are actually not involved in the motility of the organism itself because it glides, but seem to be involved in capturing bacterial prey, which seen here, it's been just grabbed by the cell and it is gradually being engulfed as the organism moves. So the, oops, yeah. So the Meteora also contains extrasomes or firing organelles that are presumably used in this uh, bacterial predation. And in fact, you can find discharged extrasomes attached to prey bacteria inside the food vacuoles that you can see in the ultrastructure. Elsewhere in the cell, you have, um, you have a nucleus under which lies a population of microtubule organizing centers attached to it. And from these microtubule organizing centers emerge, emerges a bundle of microtubules in both directions forming the long axis, shown here again from a, from a different view, uh, and are transversed by a population of uh, lateral microtubules leading to the arms. So this organism features two distinct uh, motility mechanisms, the exact me action of which is still a bit unclear. And typically um, organisms that glide use, like this euglenid here, use flagella as their, uh, as their mechanism of moving along the surface. They glide along the flagellum. However, meteora does not, it, uh, a cross section of the longitudinal microtubule bundle of Meteora shows that it does not actually have a flagellar axoneme structure like the one shown here. Um, and furthermore, a preliminary uh, search in the transcriptome for flagellar proteins has not turned up very much so far. So it appears that Meteora is missing the components necessary to be a flagellate, at least in this stage, and it is not particularly what you would imagine when you think of an amoeba either. So it's almost as if it's a whole different, unique type of cell organization for a eukaryote. It has a very unusual cytoskeleton. And because related to these features, it has no clear association with any previously um, described group. So protist X is basically kind of the opposite of Meteora. It's an anaerobe, it's a flagellate. In fact, it has four flagella that emerge in a cross-shaped pattern from the apical end of the cell, from the tip. And it lives in intertidal mudflats. So it, is, uh, it has been found before in, um, in 2000 and just mentioned as protist X, also from an intertidal mudflat. And again, from its, its uh, morphological structure, there's no obvious 
association it has with a previously established group. So it's a predator of smaller flagellates. So here is a is a protist X with soon to be food at the front of it. And here's a different cell that is in, in the, a pseudo series of it engulfing um, this uh, small uh, flagellate that's about to become food. Um, it uses, and it can feed with any surface, so it doesn't have a dedicated ingestion site that we can tell. So it has rather elaborate extrasomes that are distinct from those of, for example, Meteora or in fact any other um, uh, eukaryotic extrasome that at least I'm familiar with. And they're presumably involved in predation. So despite the difficulties posed by having um, a uh, an organism that requires other eukaryotes to feed on, we were able to establish two cultures um, of protist X. So to, to recap, we have uh, um, a flagellate uh, organism that's an aerobe and it eats bacteria. And we have an organism with four, four flagella that's an anaerobe and it eats eukaryotes. So where do they go in the, in the tree of life? So we cultivated um, a couple, we had a couple strains of each organism. We derived transcriptomes um, and um, in a process that was explained more thoroughly yesterday by Varsha Mather, um, we obtained phylogenetic marker genes from these transcriptomes. We built, and we built a concatenated um, phylogeny um, that, um, set out to include as much as best as we can represent the eukaryotic diversity in the tree of life. So in the, after running a few analyses, um, what we got was that in colors are um, these previously mentioned roughly supergroups um, and indicated uh, throughout the tree, which is not particularly important because it turns out that not only did Meteora and Candelabra not go within any of the previously established supergroups, they in fact went with each other and with the hemimastigophora mentioned at the beginning of the talk. And while we are still testing the, the stability of this relationship, it's, it seems to be very consistent throughout the wide variety of analyses we have run so far. So to reiterate, these organisms that seem to form a clade, they have very little in common with each other and they're very, um, very different and diverse. And it's kind of remarkable that they go together. However, I just want to remind you at this point that the supergroups, the other supergroups throughout the, the tree of eukaryotes are not much less um, different, uh, they're not much less diverse. So it's not out of line. So, so nothing is immediately alike. And it seems like we found perhaps uh, first representatives of perhaps a new uh, supergroup that we're just finding out about. Um, so to conclude, um, cultivation has led to us uh, finding, um, being able to characterize uh, where Meteora and Protist X go in the molecular tree of life. And it turns out they do not go within any established supergroup and in fact may themselves form a clade with the hemimastigophora. And a couple further uh, points that I'd, like to, that I'd like to make here is that um, in addition to our rediscovery of uh, these two groups, um, the rate of the discovery of these groups has not been slowing down um, lately. So it comes out to about one a year in the last uh, 15 years. And not only that, but despite the innovations in remarkable innovations in environmental sequencing and metagenomics approaches, thus far, it seems like the majority of major new lineages found still seem to come from traditional old school culturing. So cultivation remains the driving force of major lineage discovery today. And with that, I would like to thank all the wonderful people who have helped and been involved, and I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. We have time for questions. Fabian. Uh, thanks, Jana. It was really uh, 
it's really fascinating as always. Uh, I was just curious by your tree. Uh, I saw a couple of uh, things that I've never seen before. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the the placement of um, or the relationship between uh, the the haptophytes and telonymid and 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 as well as the the non relationship between haptophyte and central helid. So I was wondering if you could comment on that. It's a bit technical. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so I wanted I you remind I forgot to point out here that the back to not pay too much attention to the backbone of the tree and the actual interrelationships between these deep lineages because they're very hard to resolve at the moment. So yeah, for some reason in and I've as you know I've tinkered with the with the base uh, data set a fair bit. I seem to be getting telonemids with haptophytes very often. I actually have not been recovering um, SAR um, for some, and I, I, I have not yet run like fast site removal analyses and all, you know, those long-term um, uh, uh, processes, but yeah, I'm not, I don't know why this is happening. <laughs> we get, we get um, Hemimus to go for our with uh, telonemids. Funnily enough, <laughs> so well, maybe we should chat at some point. We should. I think it would be very interesting to talk because yeah. I'm I'm curious about what's actually happening in the the base data sets on which we run all of these analyses because I think we tend to come up with one and then we do a lot of analyses with them and that might actually be important an important difference between them. But more later. Um, <clears throat> next, we have uh, Umia. Oh my, yeah. Uh, oh my, yeah, sorry. No problem. Uh, thanks, Anna, for the talk. Uh, I just had a question about your data on the uh, microchip organizing center in Meteora. Uh, do you have a sense of how many or how many microchip organizing center you have per cell? Is it always, I mean, this image, it appears to have three. Is it always three, four, two? Does it change? Yeah, so I haven't yet counted because you need a large enough libraries of series of the cell before you can tell. I think they're not strictly defined in number, but from what I've seen, um, I think I've seen up to about eight-ish, and I think it varies. Um, the thing is that you can have more than two arms sometimes. You can actually, in certain culture conditions, get you know a six-arm monster yeah. and i don't know if this appears in nature or not but yeah. um, that was my second question is this the correlation with the number of arms with the number of my microchip organizing centers like there, there probably is um we're just starting to really look into this unfortunately but it's i'm very interested to i'll keep an eye out for that thank you sure thanks uh, next is uh, Tom Cavalier Smith. Hello, yeah, uh, this is Tom. Um, is this the transition zone of the cilium like in candelabra? It does. Uh, do either you or Shiratori know? So, <laughs> I've been working on getting a good fix of kind of Protist X for the last five years. Um, I cannot yet answer what the transition zone looks like. I apologize. Thank you. Um, Aaron Turkowitz. Um, that was a, a wonderful talk. Do you have any idea what the attachment of an extrasome to a bacterium could be doing for the for that predator? So I think it's probably this is very difficult to see in probably mostly imagination, but there's a couple pixels here that might be that point where the, the surface of the cell touches the bacterium, this uh, extrasome discharges and just glues the bacterium to the cell, kind of harpoons it to it. I suspect that's what's happening. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. I see. So you think the extrasome remains embedded in the, in the host cell while it's also attached to the bacterium? I, I suspect, yes. Um, yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, there we go. Thank you, Yana.
I don't see any more questions. So I think um, all that's left to do is sort of close the meeting. Um, before you all leave though, uh, we still have 212 people here and I don't know how many people on YouTube. I just have a couple of announcements. Um, first of all, uh, it seems to me that this format has been fairly successful. We had, uh, Havi told me this morning that there's already been 900 people have viewed the YouTube file from yesterday. So the live stream has been really uh, well used and very successful. There's been sort of on average 230 to 250 people tuned into this uh, Zoom feed uh, as a steady state. Yesterday we had something like 400 uh, independent um, unique guests. So very happy with that and also very, very international. So I, let's, I, think, that's, I think this works. So I have a couple of thank yous first. First of all, of course, um, personally, I would just want to thank Abby and, and Fabian for, uh, for doing this together as a group. It was a lot of fun, actually. Like uh, we were saying this morning, we haven't talked to each other so much since we were all living in the same city. So I'm going to miss that when we're done with our fake Zoom meetings to test all the different uh, settings and security preferences and so forth. So I just wanted to thank those two guys for that. Also, we had the, the helpers that I mentioned earlier on who have been keeping you guys out of the weight room. And I forgot yesterday to mention uh, Corey, uh, who designed our wonderful uh, animated logo, which I hope we can uh, pass on to future meeting organizers. And of course, uh, Philip Husnick, who has volunteered to organize uh, a similar sort of electronic gathering in, in an Asian Pacific time zone friendly way. And that should be happening pretty soon. And Philip asked me again, if I could just announce to keep an eye out for that, I guess on the, we're gonna hand over the protist.online website to Philip to manage. And so the information will be coming out in the same place. Um, and he's gonna be looking for proposals from students and postdocs for talks soon. Um, and lastly, uh, two things. I just wanna leave everyone with a thought, which is that, um, seems to me when we go to a face-to-face -face meeting, we spend about 80% of our time doing what we just did here electronically. And while it's not the same, I think it actually works electronically. And I would, in addition to trying to get more of these meetings off the ground and, and, and encouraging societies to use this format alongside face-to-face -face meetings for uh, people who can't or don't feel that they're able to travel to the meeting, I would like to point out that maybe we should also think about how we spend our time at face-to-face -face meetings because we're currently spending about 80% of the time where we've traveled to somewhere to do something that we probably can do fairly well remotely. Uh, personally, I'm gonna be thinking about meetings in the future and the kind of interactions that we can't do this way. And maybe those should be something that we prioritize in the future. I like coffee breaks and meals. I find a lot of the really interesting science happens at coffee breaks. <laughs> Anyway, the last thing is um, I, I wanna use the, uh, the, the mailing list that you've, if you've agreed to be on the mailing list, if you have not, then you'll be removed, don't worry. But if you've agreed to be on the mailing list, that will be another source of information for the upcoming meetings. And I also wanna just use this opportunity. I mean, we're all taking part in a pretty interesting experiment here. Other fields have done this, but I don't think our field ever has. So. I want to just get some information from this experiment so that we can do better next time. So um, I hope no one minds. I think we should send out uh, a little questionnaire because I'd love to hear what everybody thinks about, you know, what worked really well, what didn't work. Um, and I'm going to include uh, everybody on the whole 550 person registration list. So if you were able to get into the Zoom meeting, you can give us your thoughts. If you weren't, you can tell us how the YouTube stream worked and maybe we'll, um, also just ask you for your general impressions about what, what you liked about remote meetings and what you found was lacking. So we can think about how we prioritize our time and expense with in-person meetings as well in the future. Anyway, I'll leave it there. And I just also wanted to thank all the participants. I think this went very well technically, and that's partly because everybody um, did exactly uh, what we all should do. Uh, we didn't have any technical glitches. There is no Zoom bombing. There is no uh, people eating chips with their microphone on or whatever else happens in these things. So uh, I think that's been really great. I think it's amazing that all 450 of us were able to, to pull this off. So uh, 
just want to thank everyone for that. And um, if there's nothing else, I'll just say uh, goodbye and we'll see you virtually in Okinawa. So thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick and everyone. Thank you. Yes, thanks a lot, Patrick. Good job, Fabian. Good job, Javi, wherever you are. Thanks, Patrick, Fabian. Well done, well done. Javi. Thank you, everyone, for organizing this. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Excellent meeting. The recording has stopped.